And I think we can move uh, forward uh, in our um, session. And I would like to introduce you our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ricardo Pietrabon, uh, who has PhD in epidemiology, and uh, he may be characterized as a data scientist who worked uh, with uh, a number of machine learning, graph modeling, and other advanced methods of analysis. Uh, Dr. Ricardo Pietrabon is from Z4 Data. And uh, his presentation title is uh, very intriguing, Causal Machine Learning and Medicare Data in Disparities Research, from Detection to Decision Support. Uh, please, um, Dr. Petrobon, you can share now your screen. And you're very welcome to start your presentation. Thank you. So let me just make sure I get this right. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, I see, yes, I can see your screen. Yes. My slide? Uh, slide, yes. Perfect. Okay. Well, so first of all, thank you so much for the invitation for this presentation. Um, as was mentioned before, I used to be a tenured associate prof professor at Duke, uh, and I now work with a data science company. Uh, and uh, we conduct analysis in 15 countries in the European Union, all over the United States, and now in South Korea. Uh, basically, the, the, the focus of this presentation is in the uh, interaction between artificial intelligence and uh, disparities research. And I'll provide an example of a recent analysis that we did uh, using SEER Medicare. So I'd like to start with a story. Uh, back in the day when I was still an assistant professor at Duke uh, many years ago, uh, I had a, 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 a medical student working with me, um, you know, just for the sake of privacy, we'll call her Jane. Uh, that's not her real name. And Jane was African-American. Um, at one point, we got a publication in, uh, in a really good journal uh, related to surgical disparity. Um, and of course, I was absolutely thrilled, you know, that was a very good start for my career. But then Jane came to me and said, listen, uh, it looks like we got our hypothesis right. And I was like, yep, yeah, you're right. So from the very beginning, our hypothesis was that African-American patients had, um, again, I won't get into the details, but, you know, there were two possibilities for a given surgical treatment. And our hypothesis was that African-Americans were having a lower percentage of getting that better treatment. And lo and behold, that's what we found. Um, but then Jane asked me the next question, which was, um, so, uh, but are we going to do something about this? And that caught me by surprise because up to that point, you know, I was still like, you know, completely happy about having uh, made the discovery uh, about reporting this and having the paper accepted. And my immediate reaction was like, well, unfortunately we can't uh, because, you know, what we identified first of all seems to be a fairly complex social issue uh, that probably goes much beyond just the analysis that we did and probably, you know, we would have to have a huge number of resources actually to uh, uh, do something. And then she asked me the next extremely interesting question, which was, so are we making a difference? And that really caught me by surprise because, you know, my obvious answer was like, we're trying, but in reality, we're not, uh, not really. We're uncovering something, uh, but you know, at that point in today, much more than that, you know, probably dozens of thousands of papers have demonstrated the same thing. And as we know from the literature, very little has changed over the, the past few decades. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because this cycle of you know, the healthcare disparities happening at our clinics, our hospitals, et cetera, our ability to conduct analysis to identify these disparities and then publishing them, the cycle doesn't close in the vast majority of situations. The point or one of the points that I'm going to be trying to make with this presentation is that artificial intelligence gives us an opportunity to change this and start making a difference. 
uh, or at least you know, making more of a difference than uh, what we have been able to do so far. So this screen is in my slide, um, if you probably Google something like uh, Roche, the pharmaceutical company, and clinical decision making, these are you know, several different uh, uh, sections of, the, of their website uh, dedicated to clinical decision support. Now, you could ask, why is Roche, of all places, interested in clinical decision making? Uh, you know, why would a pharmaceutical company be interested in uh, uh, clinical decision making? And my main point uh, uh, in relation to disparities, as well as the point of Roche, is the same. Clinical decision making, in other words, something that's going to be whispering at you during your clinical decision making process while you're treating patients, has a huge influence and has therefore a huge potential to do good if we get the algorithms right. So the point that I'm making here, if you have read this book, uh, Nudge, now it's, uh, you know, it has been several years uh, since this has been published. One of the main things about you know, changing behavior, and here we're talking about changing in this specific situation, the behavior of clinicians in general, is to nudge. In other words, during the clinical decision-making process, you, you, you need to be whispering uh, uh, to the clinicians so that their decisions can, in our case, contribute towards the uh, decrease of healthcare disparities. Now, the problem is you can have the good nudge or the bad nudge. Um, and again, I'm, here I'm not saying that Roche has bad intentions by absolutely no means, uh, but whoever controls the algorithms has a huge power. You might think, well, you know, you're exaggerating. Well, install TikTok to your cell phone and try to get out of those addictive videos. You know, you watch one, you, you watch the next. Make absolutely no mistake. The types of clinical decision uh, uh, support systems that we are going to have in our electronic health records in 10 years from now or 15 years from now are going to be nearly as addictive uh, as uh, TikTok is today. Um, now, again, we have an option here. This could become hall for the people who are you know, familiar with this movie, so something really bad. Or we could have like a very benign uh, Dan Ariely, somebody who has good intentions, somebody who's trying to help you out. The problem, however, is that this is not only about good intentions or bad intentions. Uh, artificial intelligence, for some reason, the community that does artificial intelligence and the community that studies uh, healthcare disparities, at this point, they have been completely separate. Uh, and I'll provide a very good example, recent example from one of the journals in Nature, uh, the Nature Publishing uh, Complex. Uh, that will probably make this point. Where I'm trying to get with this is that there are several ways uh, by which you can take the exact same data sets that you have been using for your disparity, disparity research, data sets that we've been using for uh, health services research for decades probably, apply them, to, uh, uh, use them for uh, machine learning and come up with a monster. Something that would not only you know, keep uh, disparities at the level that they are, uh, but could create a vicious cycle uh, that would actually lead to the, uh, an increase in disparities. And I'm going to show you some of those examples. Before we go there, I just want to cover uh, you know, a recent paper uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine where, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing uh, Dr. Uh, Vias or Vias correctly, uh, but very interesting study. Uh, where what they did was, uh, in essence, a, a review paper, uh, where they went over not um, artificial intelligence algorithms, not decision support systems, but current scoring mechanisms that are present all over the literature and are being used in clinical decision making, uh, where they argue, uh, and I'll show you the full list in a second, uh, that these algorithms, these uh, predictions, could be leading towards uh, uh, disparity. I'll give you a couple of examples only. So for some of these algorithms, uh, 
the algorithms, if you are trying to make a prediction, essentially this is, and I'll show you an example later, uh, a web application. You go to a website or through your cell phone, you add the characteristics of the patient, and that algorithm will give you a probability of the person, for example, having a complication. Now, if this is a surgical complication, uh, and for example, if this follows the pattern, African-American and black patients, they have a higher risk of complications. You bring this into a value-based care world where everybody's trying to decrease complications because you get penalized financially for having complications. And all of a sudden, you are attaching a high-risk label to African-American and black patients. And all of a sudden, you're beginning to decline treatment to these patients. So uh, uh, VIAS or VIAS uh, provides several examples of those types of algorithms. In other situations, he provides examples of uh, algorithms, exactly the same thing, a calculator for risk of a given patient, where what you are trying to evaluate is if you should provide screening mechanisms for those patients. And in some of those algorithms, if you add that the patient uh, at a variable or you add information saying that a, that a patient is African-American or black, uh, essentially it's gonna give you a lower risk of a given condition. Well, the natural uh, response to this is if we have uh, restricted resources and there's a certain group of patients who are at a lower risk, therefore we should not do screening for those patients. Again, another way of actually uh, increasing disparities into the healthcare system. So again, I would strongly encourage you to go over this paper. Uh, there are several actually pages. This is a fascinating table, table one where uh, uh, they provide examples in cardiology, cardiac surgery, nephrology, obstetrics, urology, oncology, and so on. Now, what do these have to do with uh, uh, AI? Well, these algorithms, these calculators, let's say they are generation one of what we're now beginning to do with artificial intelligence. Now, you might say, well, but that's not really, you know, that big of a deal, because here we're trying to predict the uh, probability of a complication. We're trying to predict the probability of somebody potentially uh, having a condition. Uh, and these people, I don't know, the clinician, you know, could think a little bit better and, uh, you know, just get around this. The big problem, however, would be if we were trying to predict who should or should not have a given procedure. And of course, we're smarter than that. We're not going to be creating those uh, algorithms. Well, guess what? Uh, we do have examples of uh, how this could happen. Let me go back a little bit. Uh, and I'll give you an example in a second about breast cancer, uh, breast reconstruction after mastectomy. Uh, so again, as the entire literature that we know, uh, as you can see in this uh, 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 forest plot, uh, African-American race increases the rate of what we call homologous uh, reconstruction, which is, if you were to compare with the other standard, which is the uh, a reconstruction with silicon or another type of device, it's inferior in terms of uh, uh, results. And lo and behold, African-American patients, they end up having less of what's considered uh, the best treatment. Now, this is not an isolated study, uh, you know, here, and again, I'm just preaching to the choir. We've seen this over and over again. Four different studies essentially showing the exact same thing. Uh, whenever African-American patients, uh, 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 whenever there are two treatments uh, and one is better than the other in terms of uh, uh, reconstruction, uh, African-American patients, on average, they end up getting uh, less of the better treatment. Now, I'm not saying here that, you know, this is a simple phenomenon. There are several different things going on here. Uh, there are cultural barriers. There's issues of the relationship between uh, physicians and African-American patients. There's definitely an issue of trust uh, that has been documented throughout the literature. Um, but this whole thing that so far we have been documenting, again, could be substantially made worse if our algorithms, artificial intelligence algorithms, 
all of a sudden, uh, we're beginning to learn from our data sets and then start to make suggestions to clinicians that the old patterns should be repeated in the future. Now, you might say, no, we're not going to be making this mistake. We know much better. No, we don't. So here's a paper, again, published in 2020, recently by a group from UC, uh, UCSF, uh, actually a group of engineers, where if you read this title, I'm not even going to show you the, the abstract, but essentially here's what they're trying to do. They got a data set. They had images of uh, uh, knee osteoarthritis. Uh, and what they were trying to predict was not the, the progression of the condition or if patients were going to have complications, but what they are trying to predict is whether patients should or should not receive uh, a total knee replacement. In other words, here's a patient right, uh, right here in front of me. I get uh, the CT scan for this patient. I process through my uh, artificial intelligence uh, 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 algorithm, in this case, an image recognition uh, uh, algorithm. And this software is going to tell me uh, whether the patient should or should not have a procedure. Now, what's going on here is, again, that the algorithms, they don't learn by themselves. In order to train the algorithms, we have to use uh, the data sets that all of us have been analyzing for decades and that all of us have time and again identified as, uh, you know, uh, having disparities. So if we start training algorithms based on previously existing data sets without doing anything else, essentially we're going to create a vicious cycle. We're going to be, rather than you know, trying to get rid of disparities, uh, we're going to be uh, uh, making this uh, something that will stay forever. Uh, why? Because of the cycle used to uh, create artificial intelligence systems. So step number one is you get the data set, the data set that will, quote, teach the algorithm. Step number two, you train what we call train the model. So essentially, you get the data set. Uh, and you get the algorithm to start learning uh, 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 patterns. If the pattern was, okay, if this patient is an African-American patient, I should be less likely to offer her uh, breast reconstruction surgery or, for example, total knee replacement. The algorithm is simply going to mimic that. Uh, the algorithm is not intelligent uh, uh, to know better. Uh, the algorithm is simply going to follow what was done in the past. That algorithm then becomes a decision support system. In other words, it's think of it as like this little window in your elect, uh, uh, electronic health record, which says, okay, I've analyzed this patient. This patient is African-American, uh, has diabetes, has this, this, and that. My recommendation is you should not offer breast reconstruction. Because based on my records, based on what I've learned, um, that's the pattern. You know, that's the best course of action. Uh, and then finally, going back to the nudging, if you uh, have the, uh, uh, a hall, uh, you know, whispering to your ear all day long that these types of patients should not get a certain treatment, essentially, you're going to be complying. And you're going to transfer that disparity uh, back into your, into your clinical practice. Now, a few more things. This is a, a paper, a recent paper, 2019 uh, in uh, uh, science, actually. Um, and very interestingly, uh, what they did was to take, you know, just so that this doesn't become, yeah, Ricardo has some kind of conspiracy theory. Uh, essentially, what they did was to analyze one of these algorithms that is in place in a hospital. Um, they actually don't, do not disclose the hospital for obvious reasons. But essentially what they have done, and this is the fear of what is probably or likely going to be happening unless uh, we do something, is the following. If you look at the, the, the plot uh, on your left, essentially what this is showing is the following. On the x-axis, you have the score. Think of this as the score provided by the artificial intelligence uh, algorithm. And essentially what you are seeing here is that for the exact same score, uh, the yellow line uh, is uh, the number of comorbidities 
uh, or chronic conditions for uh, white patients. And the purple line is the number of uh, uh, chronic conditions for uh, black and African-American patients. So essentially what this is saying is that this is the disparity being propagated for the exact same score. So in other words, for a score that should, in theory, have classified patients who are at the exact same risk, you have patients uh, who are white who have a lower level of chronic conditions and black patients or African-American patients who have a higher uh, rate of chronic conditions. Uh, the plot on the left is just an algorithm that they created trying to minimize this, but I wanna call your attention to several other conditions where the exact same thing starts happening. So what the author is doing here is just simply drilling down. And what uh, they have found is that the exact same pattern hap happens across comorbidities. So hypertension, the same score, generated by an algorithm that's similar to an AI algorithm. Uh, for patients with uh, white patients, they have uh, lower comorbidity in relation to hypertension. Uh, black patients, African-American patients have a higher level. Diabet diabetes se severity, cholesterol, uh, renal failure, anemia, all of them with the exact same pattern. Now, what's really interesting is you could say, okay, you know, the solution is simple. Let's just get rid of uh, uh, the race variable uh, into our algorithms. Well, bad news, that alone will not work. So essentially what you will be seeing here uh, on the plot on the left is that if you take the uh, same algorithm or the same score uh, and you use some other kind of proxy, for example, in this case, they used cost. Uh, essentially, what you're seeing here is this would be like a, a graphic that would look really, really good for the hospital saying, listen, uh, for patients with the exact same score or probability of something bad, uh, we're having the exact same uh, expenditures. Well, we saw, however, that the algorithms, they are biased uh, uh, from the, the, the get-go, which means that if you take the expenditures and then you adjust for uh, uh, the level of comorbidities, you come back with the exact same pattern. So the main message here is that simply getting uh, race out of the equation is not a solution uh, because race uh, is not only about the color of your skin. Uh, it's a constellation of multiple factors, uh, response to disease, social cultural factors, uh, bias, racism, um, all of these. So essentially, uh, the next question is, what can we do? So uh, that's a great question. And I don't think anybody at this point has a perfect answer. What I want to show you are some initial examples of an analysis that we did with Sierra Medicare, just to show you a few possibilities uh, where artificial intelligence, machine learning could contribute uh, in relation to disparities research and down the line, uh, help attenuate at least the disparities through uh, decision support systems. So uh, this first plot is the, uh, 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 what we call an unsupervised uh, uh, machine learning algorithm, where essentially what it does uh, it is that it clusters populations across two groups. In this group, uh, let's call them cluster one in blue and cluster two uh, in red. So Whenever we're running these uh, uh, clusters, we tend to mix outcome variables with predictors. Uh, and later on, once we identify who are the individuals within each one of these clusters, we start analyzing them. For the sake of simplicity, you know, the only thing that I did here was to put uh, uh, some tables uh, to establish some comparison. So this, again, this is a very preliminary analysis. Uh, what you can see here is that uh, cluster two has a slightly uh, 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 higher frequency of Black and African-American patients. Um, and lo and behold, we knew this from the literature. Uh, when you compare uh, the reconstruction, by the way, these are breast cancer patients. Uh, when you compare the, 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 the rates of implants versus autologous, implant being a better option in general, uh, you will have a much higher rate of implants among white patients in a much uh, higher rate of autologous or the lower, 
in most cases, inferior choice uh, among African-American patients. Now, the good news in terms of cluster analysis is that you don't have to do this one step at a time or analyze this one variable at a time. Uh, you can get, again, an entire constellation of other variables that uh, are probably associated with that disparity. Uh, so I just picked a few examples. We had like a host of variables from CR Medicare, but again, elderly patients, they tend to uh, not get treatments uh, or the uh, best treatment. Uh, patients living in rural areas or non-urban areas, same thing. Uh, they tend not to get uh, the, 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 the best treatments. Uh, and there are a big discrepancy between grade two and grade uh, three tumors. Now, am I saying that this is a simple phenomenon? Am I saying that uh, you know, healthcare professionals uh, uh, control everything that can actually take care or decrease disparities? Absolutely not, absolutely not. Again, there are issues of access to care, there are cultural issues at play, uh, but there's a number of different factors. Next step in terms of machine learning is to actually build the algorithms that will make the suggestions uh, that will serve as the basis for uh, these uh, uh, decision support systems. Uh, this is, you know, something that we use frequently just to determine the, the accuracy uh, of these algorithms. So in the case of this uh, 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 specific machine learning algorithm, we were just trying to predict uh, the probability of a complication after surgery. Uh, we didn't spend much time. Usually you need like, you know, two to three months just uh, 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 refining the model. Uh, but still, you know, even with like, probably we spent one day on this, uh, uh, you still, you, you get a fairly reasonable uh, idea or, or performance in terms of the models. But what I want to call your attention to is that by using a traditional uh, uh, artificial intelligence model, if we were to just do this, we would be propagating uh, the disparity. Because all we did here, which might seem nice, you know, potentially with some more work, we could publish this. Uh, but just with this, uh, all the biases that come with the data set would be propagated through our results. Essentially now there is, uh, or there are different types of models uh, that can uh, at least minimize the degree of bias. So for example, the bias by indication, the surgical indication uh, can be taken care of, for example, uh, through some novel types of artificial intelligence uh, modeling or machine learning modeling, where you can incorporate things that are familiar to health services researchers, such as uh, inverse probability weighting. Uh, what you do there uh, is the following. Imagine that a completely, uh, 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 how can I say, uh, uh, an algorithm that is completely uh, colorblind, that does not uh, carry any type of disparity would be represented by the black line. So in other words, you, you would be allocating the exact same types of resources. You would make everybody equal. The problem is that doesn't happen. Um, race, even though there's a lot of uh, 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 other factors associated with it, uh, it's still an important variable to be included in these algorithms. If you leave race without any type in the models, without any type of uh, uh, confounding adjustment, however, uh, you would get the, the, the line in green or CN, uh, which, is, uh, which means that the, your resources would be far less allocated to African-American patients uh, uh, compared to white patients. If you do some adjustment, uh, however, uh, your line would become the red line which means you're minimizing the problem, but probably because we cannot account for a number of social determinants of health and other factors, we cannot fully get rid of the disparity. This is the place, uh, however, where you could get the nudging going. What do I mean by this? Um, let me just switch here to a screen. And I don't know if this is clear, uh, but essentially you can transform uh, your um, uh, algorithm into something that would provide a decision support system. I screen such uh, similar to this uh, 
in, inside your uh, electronic health record. And that same uh, uh, screen would provide you with not only the post-op complications, probability of post-op complications or probability of recurrence, but it could also provide with causes. Again, we're talking about uh, causal modeling here, and you can make a prediction of the likely causes for individual patients right there and then. And if some of those causes are potentially addressable, so for example, if diabetes is the main factor contributing to uh, Mary, who's going to have a mastectomy, uh, therefore we should have something uh, in place to assist Mary control her diabetes. If smoking is a, a risk factor for another patient, then we go straight for measures to try to address uh, the smoking problem. Just go back to my slides. So essentially, the idea here is the following. I don't think, given our current knowledge in terms of artificial intelligence, the main messages are, number one, uh, there are mechanisms to reduce uh, disparity in the algorithms. We should be using them. Number two, there's a dire need for collaboration among three types of researchers, health services researchers, this community. Number two, artificial intelligence uh, researchers, people who are not aware of the potential damage that uh, they are currently doing. And number three, implementation science uh, researchers, people who can assist the other two types of researchers in uh, translating all the information we've been gathering uh, into making something that will truly make a difference, something that would be the Dan Ariely for good, something that would be whispering on the uh, ears of clinicians so that whatever is within their control, whatever is within their power, uh, that they can actually make a difference. In other words, it's uh, probably the time more than ever uh, for researchers to take the spot and uh, do something that up, uh, up until this time, uh, we were very limited in terms of what we could do. In other words, reduce disparities. Last, uh, I'm talking about breast cancer, but the exact same thing uh, can and probably should be applied to other areas. Colorectal cancer, where the disparities are humongous, uh, lung cancer, prostate cancer, where we all know, especially in terms of screening, uh, disparities are uh, uh, absolutely terrible. That's it. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you, Ricardo, for your presentation. It was a very interesting presentation. Unfortunately, we do not have right time, time uh, for question. So if somebody will have uh, questions, so you can post it at Q&A, and then we will move it to tomorrow's round table, and we'll try to answer these questions tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo.